Well, 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 yesterday we saw the importance of the invisible God, the invisible king in our lives, brothers and sisters. And I asked you rhetorically, didn't I, to, to reflect upon that, whether the Lord Jesus Christ is truly reigning within our lives. Well, today we're going to come across Saul for the first time. There has been a gradual build up for the coming king. Judges closes with, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We, we saw, didn't we, how Hannah prayed for the ideal king. How God had continually demonstrated to them that he was their king, that there was nothing for them to fear. Yet God's people requested, make us a king. And so then Samuel and Almighty God, they converse. Remember how God spoke to Samuel three times, hearken unto the people. And, and eventually Samuel relented and the king was appointed. So with all the tension, with all the apprehension, with all the anxiety, let's see who this king was. So let's open up our Bibles this morning then and let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 9. So here we're introduced to this man, the first appointed king. We read these words in verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Bekorah, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than Saul. From his shoulders and upwards, the, he was higher than any of the people. So I want you to notice a few details there. We, we see at the end of verse 1 that he was a mighty man of power. We're going to come across that phrase a little later. Though it related to his father, it also related to him. A mighty is the Hebrew Gabor, man of power, Sheil. And this description belonged to someone that I believe, personally, Saul had high aspirations to emulate. And we're going to come across that man a little later. So just notice that phrase, he was a mighty man of power. And if you look at concordance, it can mean one of two things. It can actually mean a mighty man of strength or a mighty man of possessions. In fact, the same description is used of Boaz, the same Boaz who, who married Ruth. He was a mighty man of possessions. We read of that in Ruth 2 and verse 1. But, but there was something about Saul that really... Um, strengthened his candidacy to become the first king. You notice there that he was a choice young man and he was goodly. You may have in your Bible something like he was young and beautiful. In fact, it goes on to say that there was no one in Israel that was goodlier than he. He excelled in beauty, brothers and sisters. There was no one that could even compare to this man. In all his beauty. And what distinguished this man from all other men in the whole nation of Israel, from his shoulders upwards we read, he was higher than any other person. So what a candidate we have before us. And so then there was a, a natural choice. If you wanted to have a king, a king like the surrounding nations, then this was the supreme specimen in all of the nation, Saul. But surely this was not a necessary or sufficient quality to have for the king of Israel. Now, now the, the, the scriptures in these opening verses in chapter 9 really do labour the point that this was a man who was from a renowned family. He had excellent financial means. He possessed great physical beauty. And we can picture him well. But in these words, brothers and sisters, and in these descriptions, surely it is emphasizing to the reader when we discern these things between the lines that this is not exactly what God was looking for. These are external, exterior qualities. May I say, they are. They are superficial, yet they are so alluring. What a powerful lesson, brothers and sisters, in the establishment of the kingdom of God under a new king, the king of Israel being sore here. Uh, how sad it is that we are being reminded of these superficial qualities. This desire 
to put our trust in princes. Remember those words in Psalm 146. And we all fail, don't we, brothers and sisters? We all look to those that we want to make king in our lives rather than looking to our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. So these qualities then, dare to say, made him a very popular man in all of Israel. And I believe his own marketing campaign was building up. He was the natural choice to be king. And and Samuel is going to acknowledge that in a moment. Well, interestingly, you may have noticed on the slide before that his name means prayed for. And and again, that there's something that hints that this man was going to be a very different man to Samuel. Remember what Samuel's name means. Asking of the Lord, asking of Yahweh. It, it, it's in the passive tense, isn't it? We mentioned that yesterday, Shema. He's always asking of the Lord. He was in continual conversation. There was an intimate development in their relationship there, brothers and sisters. But here was Saul, who prayed for. But there's no ascription to God, is there? There's no ascribing to God in anything of that name. So that seems to suggest to me at least that there was something a little different about this man. Well, I'm sure we know the account well as we make our way down at the early verses of 1 Samuel chapter 9. We can see that Saul had lost his she-asses. This is how we're introduced to this man. And and, um, as you glance down, you can see that he uh, passes through Ephraim with his servant and he makes his way to Zuf. Um, And you can see um, these places there um, on the screen. Now, it's interesting because um, as he makes his way through Ephraim and he goes through Zuf, uh, you can see there that the distance between where he went from to where Samuel resided was merely five miles. And, and we know the account well. This is a man, Saul, who had no understanding that, that the man of God, this great prophet, actually resided in Shiloh. In fact, when he met him, which we were about to see, he didn't even recognize this man, though this man was highly distinguished in his appearance. So this was a man who was flawed, brothers and sisters, no different to any of us. And in many ways, we can take great exhortation because God is not going to let this man down. He's going to be with this man throughout his life. God is relentless with Saul, encouraging this man to be the man that God hoped him to be. Well, as we read these verses, we can see that they've gone three days there. And Saul is anxious. He's concerned about his father. He's worried that his father would be concerned about their whereabouts and their safety. And so right away, then we see a good redeeming quality there in King Saul to be that there he was. He was concerned about the feelings of his father. That's a good thing, isn't it, brothers and sisters? That's a good thing. But we're about to see that this was a man who was so ill prepared for God. Look at this then. So as they make their way to Ramah here... Uh, The servant of Saul says, in this little phrase you see in verse 6, that that we're approaching this city that this man of God belongs to. Notice there in the opening words of verse 6. And so, not full disclosure is provided for us that this was actually Samuel. He's this man of God. But then you go to verse 7. Then said Saul to his servant, but behold, if we go, what shall we bring this man? This man, it's again repeated in, in verse 8. It's almost like it's, it's really stressing in these opening verses that actually Saul didn't know who this man of God was. So vague in his understanding, brothers and sisters. This man, for the bread is spent in our vessels and there is not a present to bring to the man of God what we have. And so right away, then, we see that this was a man who was ill-prepared. He'd gone on a journey for three days, and he had no provisions at all. He had no money. He had nothing. And he's thinking about asking Saul, or asking Samuel, I should say, where his she-asses are, which is totally inappropriate, isn't it? To go and speak to the judge of Israel about a few mules that had gone missing. This was Saul, brothers and sisters. But we're going to see that in this foolishness, God is still with this man. Well, this is a man who was unprepared. And as we look down in verse 10, then said Saul to his servant, well, said, come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. And and, and isn't this bewildering and also quite disturbing, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that now they make their way to Ramah, where this man of God, and not only was he a man of God, he was... um, uh, 
distinguished, wasn't he? We've already seen yesterday that he was a man who served God all his years. Yet he didn't know. He didn't know, brothers and sisters. Well, elsewhere in Ramah, whilst this, let's say, chaos was going on, something altogether different was happening elsewhere. Something very profound was taking place. Careful instruction was given by God to Samuel. Let's just look at this, this careful plan that was being developed here. Verse 15, then, of um, 1 Samuel 9. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come upon me. There's a lot of detail there which we're going to pick out, but just first of all, notice this Beautiful phrase, brothers and sisters. Now, the Lord told Samuel in his ear. Can you notice that? And have a look in your margin. What does it say there? It says that God revealed the ear of Samuel. If you've got the revised version margin, the Hebrew um, renders this, uncovered the ear of Samuel. So this is a very intimate and close expression, how God spoke so quietly. Remember what I said yesterday about these whispering companions. This again emphasizes that they were whispering companions. They were in constant conversation throughout the life of Samuel, asking of the Lord. What a wonderful picture, brothers and sisters, of ears and a heart that was open. Now we know, and we already mentioned it yesterday, but we must go there. What is the connection there, brothers and sisters? Well, Samuel is presented as this wonderful type of the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's exactly what Christ did. Let's look at it. We all know it well. Come with me to Isaiah 50, please. Isaiah 50. We we mentioned these words yesterday in passing. And there's some lovely phrases here concerning um, Almighty God, who got his son up each and every morning and spoke in his ear, and how his ear was opened. And we know the idea of the gall there, how the servant had his ear pierced to commit as a, as a public demonstration that he was going to be this master's servant. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ, throughout his days, and similarly with Samuel, but, but also there's a very natural understanding of this as well, how God spoke to him every single morning. Verse 4 then, the Lord God had given me the tongue of the learned. Who's speaking these words, brothers and sisters? It's in the first personal pronoun here. This is the Redeemer that is speaking these words. These are words of the Lord Jesus Christ. 600 years before he came upon the scene. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning my morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. What a, a wonderful figure of Samuel we have here, brothers and sisters. And isn't it wonderful that the Lord Jesus Christ, who received the Spirit beyond measure, with all the knowledge and all that understanding and all those mornings that he shared in close companionship with his God, what did he do with it, brothers and sisters? What did he do with this incredible knowledge of God's purpose and plan? He applied all that wisdom so that he could pick out men and women who needed help, who needed succor, who needed encouragement, who needed support, so that he could lift them up and buoy them up. He could find that word in season and boom, it was there. Are you like that, brothers and sisters? What what, what do you do with your knowledge from Bible schools? What what do you intend to do next Sunday, brothers and sisters, when we all get back to our ecclesial homes? Do you use your wisdom to help and to edify and to build up? Or do we cut down and destroy? This was the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was the picture of Samuel as well, brothers and sisters. This was a a life of edification and encouragement. It's a wonderful example for us all, and we should ask ourselves how we use, how we apply the knowledge that we have graciously gleaned from God's word through his helpful hand of provision. What have we done with it, brothers and sisters? How have we used our time? 
Well, this closeness between Samuel and the Lord God, similarly with the Lord Jesus Christ and his heavenly father, was forged over many years. In fact, a lifetime. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. We also made mention of that yesterday. This young Samuel who goes and instructs Eli, what's it going to happen within his family? The whole priesthood was going to be devastated, that not one of them was going to be uh, left, not one of them would remain, that, that Eli falls off the back of the chair as a symbol of the unredeemed priesthood. Remember that? God and Samuel were in close conversation all the years of his life. And as we said, it's in the passive sense. He was always Listening. Can I just illustrate this? Come back to 1 Samuel. Let's have a look at eight, uh, chapter 8 now, please. We want to look at verse 21 of chapter 8. And we know the context of this chapter. We concluded there where God speaks to Samuel three times. You've got to hearken, Samuel. You've got to listen. You've got to respond to what they're saying. And look at these words in verse 21. And Samuel heard all the words of the people. Look at this. And he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. Isn't that lovely? What a, what a lovely expression that is. That the Spirit chooses to use of this close companionship, ear to ear, of Samuel and his God. That Samuel was listening and his ear was open, but so was Almighty God's ear listening to the words of Samuel. As Samuel rehearsed the words in the ears of his God. And so then, this is why Samuel could be God's representative. Because he knew his God. How can we be God's representatives, brothers and sisters, if we do not hear his word? That's why we are men and women of the book. How can we be God's representatives if we're not listening to his word, brothers and sisters? It's that wonderful example of Mary. Remember Mary who sat at the feet of the Lord before she did anything. And that was the lesson that Martha had to learn. Everything that we do in the Lord's service begins, brothers and sisters, it begins at the feet of the Lord. We can't do anything. Until we begin at the feet of the Lord. And this was a a lesson that Samuel taught God's people. And it's a lesson for us, brothers and sisters. Now, now it's a lovely thing. It's a lovely idea because sometimes we just just need to picture what's going on in our own minds. Come back to chapter one. Something we haven't mentioned. Yes, of course, Samuel was dedicated in this vow. a, A vow of Hannah, which could have been redeemed by Elkanah in Numbers chapter 30. But Elkanah made this vow his. But this vow was a little more than we, we kind of hinted yet yesterday because you notice um, as you go on at the end of verse 11 that she wants this man-child, the seed of the men, right? This idea of preserving the promise. There was no king in all Israel. There's no priesthood. The whole thing was at the, going to the war, right? And she, she, she asks for someone who's going to work with a king to bring about the preservation of God's people. But he goes on to say, I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon his head. And if you look in your margin, it takes you all the, back, all the way back to where? <clears throat> Numbers chapter 6 and verse 5. And so then this was um, the Nazarite vow, brothers and sisters. And so this man becomes a Nazarite. Uh, and one of the, um, the distinguishing uh, features, physical features of a Nazarite, as you know through your stories of Samson, was that a Nazarite was never to cut his hair. Uh, and now, from, from 1 Samuel chapter 8, we know that, that, that Saul, who um, is going to live through the life of Samuel, by the time we come to chapter 8, uh, Samuel is an old man. And, and I want you to picture him, uh, long-haired and grey. Sometimes we feel a bit like that, don't we, brothers and sisters? Long-haired and grey. So how could God speak in his ear? Well, he has to pull the hair aside, doesn't he? And so then, there's a picture in our minds of real physical companionship here. It's a very intimate expression, isn't it? If your ears are covered with your hair as a Nazarite, then the ear needs to be opened, just as we read In Isaiah chapter 50, there Samuel's ear was opened. His hair was brushed aside by God as he spoke in his ears. Isn't that lovely, brothers and sisters? A real 
physical companionship between Samuel and Almighty God all his years. Yes, of course, though. Samuel was listening very carefully. He was hanging on every word, wasn't he? But there was something very disturbing in what God said to Samuel because we read, as we've just looked at there, in chapter 9 and verse 16, that it was going to be of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin that the first king of Israel would come from. And as we know, the very closing words of Jacob to his 12 sons in Genesis chapter 49 that that provide the promises, right? And this wonderful prophecy of the sons. We read there, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh shall come. So Jacob discloses to his 12 sons that the royal family comes from Judah. David was going to come from Judah, but here Benjamin is the tribe that provides the first king. So, as you answer that question for yourselves, come back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 23. I I think there's something interesting here under the law. You can tell me what you think afterwards. I'm going to suggest that God always intended to have a king. God had stipulated it in in Deuteronomy chapter 17, as we looked at yesterday. But he had a king in mind. And when we come back to Deuteronomy chapter 23, there's something in the law that's interesting. And and, and bear in mind that when this law was written, David wasn't even upon the scene. And look at these words here, Deuteronomy chapter 23 then. So then we read in verse 2, an illegitimate shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. I'm sure we're all very familiar um, with with, um, verse 2. But it's interesting, isn't it, when we reflect upon Judah, who married Tamar, um, that this relationship bore out under the law, as the law looked at this, illegitimate children under the law. And isn't it interesting that from Tamar and Judah, David was the 10th generation. So David was the 10th generation of a promise that was shining on the family of Judah. Genesis 49. And David was the first in that line to walk out of the curse And God used him. So I'm suggesting right here in Deuteronomy chapter 23, when the law had gone forth concerning the 10th generation and Jacob had disclosed to his children concerning the scepter of Judah, my thought anyway is that God always intended, always intended to have a king. And that king was always in his mind as he knew about his son. Jesus Christ being the greatest son of David, it's my belief anyway that his choice in his mind was always David. But his arm is bent. God is frustrated. And he gives them a king before he intended to. And he gives them a king, not what they need, but what they want. What they want, brothers and sisters. But though God gave a man what they wanted rather than what they needed, nevertheless, God was with that man. Can you, can, you, can you see the difference there? It's really, really important. That was never God's choice. But he would never leave that man. He would never leave that man. And we're going to develop that this morning. Well, let's come back to 1 Samuel chapter 9. So, so this idea then that this was going to be a king, not that God wanted, but he was never going to leave him. Um, We're going to see that. We're going to see now that that God is presenting this man to Samuel in a particular way. And and in these words, we can see that God had a particular intention with him. He had a particular intention with him, not what we may be expecting. Well, look at these words then. Um, We've already read them briefly. Tomorrow we read... um, About this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, Genesis 49... Uh, Samuel would have had questions, thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. Well, notice 
um, how God describes this man. He doesn't refer to him as a king, does he, brothers and sisters? He, he refers to him as a captain over my people. You may have in your margin a prince. The revised version margin has a leader. And this is really important, isn't it? Uh, God is presenting Saul to Samuel as a prince, as a leader, as a military campaigner, but not as a king. Anoint him as a captain, anoint him as a priest, because here, brothers and sisters, I believe that, yes, of course, Saul was going to be appointed the king of Israel, but here God was still their king. He was not prepared to truly relinquish relinquish the kingship. He was the king. And he was more than head and shoulders over anyone in Israel, wasn't he? That was never going to be a defining characteristic to be the first king of Israel. He was looking for a man who had his heart, not his stature. And so he appoints this man as a captain. Now, you might be thinking, well, perhaps then this is suggesting that this man was going to fail, that he would never fulfill the role of a king. Well, we need to go on in these words in verse 16, because it says, appoint him a captain or a leader that he may save my people out of the land, out of the hand of the Philistines. Well, just think about that for a moment, because we've seen a few things, haven't we? What we saw yesterday, that as long as Samuel lived, God had his hand over the Philistines. We remember the stone, Ebenezer. Remember that? How God helped the children of Israel when the Philistines attacked. They they had nothing to worry about the Philistines. Yet God says, yes, we'll appoint a military leader to fight against the Philistines. There's a, there's a touch of irony in all that, isn't there, brothers and sisters? He didn't need them to fight the Philistines. But that's exactly what they wanted, so that is what God provided for them. They wanted someone that they could physically see. God was doing all these things in the background. God was this military campaigner for them. He fought the Philistines all the days of Samuel, that they wanted someone that they could see, someone who had the physical equal of the nations around them. And brothers and sisters, we can be so similar, can't we? It's interesting, isn't it, that Samuel's presented, um, presents to us this, this whole idea of Saul being a captain, because who is the captain in our lives? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the captain of our salvation. And brothers and sisters, as we reflect upon our lives, just for a moment, I'm sure we can all recall, probably painstakingly, heartbreakingly, moments in our lives where we've made other people captains in our lives. We've been swayed, we've been influenced, and perhaps we've even compromised. Because we can't see the Lord. We can only hear the Lord. We can only see him through the eye of faith, can't we? And that's the lesson, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Psalm 146, verse 3, put not your trust in princes. And at times we can put our trust in people in the truth, may I say. We make princes of brothers and sisters, and it is wrong. Christ is our head, and we are the body of Christ. And we all have to learn that lesson the hard way, don't we? I'm sure at times we've experienced things like that, and the consequences have been quite dire. Put not your trust in princes. And this is the point, brothers and sisters. We, we, we struggle at times when we have an invisible God. And we like to see things that are tangible, material, things that we can hold on, grasp. Well, this is the warning, brothers and sisters. God gave them what they wanted, something that they could see. But all was not lost, though I've said those things. Look at this, it's a lovely phrase, and you can, you, can, you can easily miss it at the end of verse 16. God says, yes, sir, I'll give you a king. I'll make him a prince. He'll fight the Philistines, though you don't need to. Yes, of course, it's all kind of pointless in many ways. But look at this, brothers and sisters, because though there's a touch of irony, God is not mocking them. God is not mocking them. Look at this. For I've looked upon my people, because this cry is come unto me. And I want to show you here, brothers and sisters, the compassion of God here. Though God's people had nothing to fear with the Philistines, they were fearful. It was a real fear for them. And God heard it. And he responded to it. And brothers and sisters, many of the obstacles and challenges and the problems and the enemies that we have in this life, they're not real. 
but we see them as real. And God doesn't mock us. He doesn't laugh at our foolishness and our faithlessness. He responds as a father. Look at this. I have looked upon my people because their cries come unto me. Look in your margin. What, what does that take you back to? Have you ever noticed that margin note, brothers and sisters? It's Exodus chapter 2. And who was Moses? He was a leader. He wasn't a king. And I'm going to show you, brothers and sisters, that God is now going to take this man and he's going to work with this man. And he's going to try to make this man a Moses figure, not a king, but a prince. And that's exactly what Moses was, wasn't it? He was a prince of Egypt. And it's the very phrase. Let's have a look at this. Look at this. Come with me to Exodus chapter 2. These are real words. And the Philistines, brothers and sisters, take on this role of the Egyptians. They are oppressing God's people, just as the Philistines did. And so now God responds in this faithful way as you'd expect a father. And he gives them a, a leader, a military campaign, a man who was head and shoulders, a man he could have, that they could have confidence in. And he's going to work with this man, brothers and sisters. For I looked upon my people because their cries come upon me. Look at this, um, Exodus chapter 2. We're just going to pick out the phrases that are found in your margin. Verse 24 of chapter 2. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect upon them. You'll notice in your margin, took knowledge of them. He understood them. He appreciated. He empathized as a father. Chapter 3 and verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt and have heard their cry for reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. This is the very language that we find in 1 Samuel, brothers and sisters. This was real. The Philistines now take on the role of the Egyptians. Saul now takes on, as it were, a figure of Moses. Their cries come upon me. And then verse 9 of chapter 3. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. And so what does God do? He sends them a deliverer. He sends them Moses. A man who knew God face to face. That's the difference, brothers and sisters. Can you see it? Isaiah 50 and Samuel, all these wonderful examples there. Yes, Saul didn't do that. He was a man who closed his ears. A man was blind, brothers and sisters. And that's what happens, isn't it? When your ears are closed to God's word, when you see Samuel, you don't even recognize him. If we're deaf, we become spiritually blind. Come back then to 1 Samuel chapter 9. So with these thoughts in mind, then, that Saul now is going to present um, himself as a, a Moses figure. Someone who had the potential to be the equal to Moses, the first king of Israel, a redeemer of God's people. Someone who was going to really bring authority to the nation, who was going to stamp underfoot the power of the Philistines. Well, let's just go on a verse then in chapter 9, verse 17. And when Samuel saw, saw, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee, this same shall reign over my people. So this is then the, the first moment when Saul um, lays eyes on Samuel and Samuel sees Saul for the first time. But notice there, the Lord said unto him, have a look in your margin. You may have, certainly has in the revised version margin. He answered him. Again, it's highlighted this fact that they were in this continual conversation. He answered him. Well, answered him what? It doesn't tell us that there was any conversation at this point in time. Well, it suggests, doesn't it, that in verse 15, God says to Samuel, Look, you're going to meet Saul. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. You're going to anoint him tomorrow. And then the following day, God answers him. So it implies then a prayer had been given by Samuel. No doubt. He was perplexed. He couldn't understand it. He asked God after these words had been given to him. Well, I, I don't understand. Genesis 49. The tribe of Judah. And so God answers him that prayer. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? Uh, God's just not intervening with words. It's a continual dialogue between God 
and Samuel. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? Well, they're in deep conversation. No doubt Samuel is concerned whether this man is suitable. He can't understand why God has been cast to one side, why God has been rejected. And it's worth just pondering just for a moment as we just move our way through this chapter. Are we in continual conversation with God, brothers and sisters? Prayer is such a feature of discipleship that, that is so hard to develop, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And I'm sure as we reflect upon our lives, there are moments where we are men and women of prayer, and there are moments when we're silent. It happens to all of us. But what, what kind of relationship? Do we have? And, and, and to listen to God, we need to be listening to his word, don't we? This is why Bible schools are good. This is why Bible classes are good. This is why our Bible readings are good. So that we can get down into the scriptures and we can listen to God. Continually listening. How can we be God's representatives if we're not listening to God's word? And that helps our prayer. That helps our conversation, brothers and sisters. So Saul was a man that lacked prayer. He was a man who didn't allow God to enter into his heart. So ask yourselves the same question, brothers and sisters. What is the quality of your prayer life? Your family life, prayer. Prayers with your family, children, your grandchildren. This is what we need to be, brothers and sisters. This was the contrast, wasn't it, between Samuel and Saul. Well, God then tells him, look, Saul, I've assured you, I've assured you, Samuel, this is the man Saul. Look at this. Behold the man, um, God says to Samuel there in verse 17, which is interesting, isn't it? Uh, that is interesting because these are the very words that were sounded out in John 19, verse 5, where the Lord Jesus Christ stands upon the stage there with the crown of thorns upon his head. And it says in the word Pilate, doesn't it? I'm sure you know this in John 19, in italics. The translators don't know whether it was actually Pilate who said the words. It's my own view. It was God who said these words. Behold the man. And it's God who says the words, behold the man. These two bookends, two kings, the first and the last king, behold the man. As they are there, witness towards God's people. Behold the man. And as Samuel looked upon this man, there was no man who was goodlier than this man. He was in the prime of life. He was this fine specimen, brothers and sisters. He was head and shoulder above the nation of Israel. Behold the man. What a difference when the nation beheld the real man. Can we have a look at that? Isaiah 53, brothers and sisters. What a contrast. What a contrast as the nation beheld the real king. Isaiah 53 then. Verse 1, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. Can you see that? What a contrast for Saul. There was no man goodlier than Saul. This man had no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Two bookends, the kingship of Israel goes on, doesn't it? He is despised and rejected of men, a, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Can you have a more striking contrast than that, brothers and sisters? Yet it could have been so different for Saul. He's presented as Moses, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet he failed. He failed God, brothers and sisters, and by failing God, he failed himself. Let's look at this mind in action. Come back to 1 Samuel chapter 9. Saul's going to be speaking to Samuel now and he won't even know about it. There he is, he finds himself in Ramah there in verse 18. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, tell me I pray thee where the sea's house is. And, and there he is, he's speaking to the, the Holy See here. Samuel, and as we've already mentioned, when you don't listen to God's word, then you become blind, brothers and sisters. And this is what happened to Saul. The fact that Samuel, throughout his life, had gone from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, he had made an altar at Ramah, 
uh, just remind ourselves in 1 Samuel 3, just go back there please, 1 Samuel chapter 3, look at these words here, and Samuel grew, verse 19, the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. That's Luke chapter 2, verse 14, 42, isn't it? That's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. These words were ascribed to the Lord. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the whole nation knew that Samuel had been devoted under this vow, that he was this special prophet, priest and judge. They would have all known about Hannah's prayer. They would have gone to Shiloh at the Feast of Tabernacles. And at Passover and witnessed Samuel, this, this man that had been dedicated to God's service. And there was Saul, a man who lived five miles away, the king elect, and he doesn't even recognize him, brothers and sisters. He doesn't even recognize him. Now, we can't imagine that we would do that. Just looking at Samuel with his robe, his mantle. A robe that was going to be torn with his long hair as a Nazarite. It would have been obvious, wouldn't it, brothers and sisters, if we'd gone to Ramah? We would have known Samuel. Well, maybe there's another way of thinking about this. What about? What about, brothers and sisters, without us even knowing, we came into contact with a Bible character? Would you be able to distinguish that Bible character from their dress, from the things that they said, their character, their disposition? I wonder, brothers and sisters, maybe some of the more obscure characters in Scripture. That's the same idea, isn't it? Because we get to know these characters through our reading. I'll make another point. When we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and there's Brother Don, talking about all the things that are taking place in the earth. When we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, we've said that so many times. When we stand, and we will stand, when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the judgment seat, will we know him? Yes, of course, we'll know that he's the king of the Jews. He's come to save the world. But will we know him? Will he be an intimate companion and friend, brothers and sisters? Or will he say to us, I never knew thee. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. It's the same idea, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Knowing the Lord today. The passive tense. Every single day. So it's no different, brothers and sisters. And the lesson is very direct. Well, come back to 1 Samuel chapter 9. The prophet is given very careful and clear instruction in chapter 9 here. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for he shall, ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go and will tell thee what is in thine heart. So here now, Samuel takes real control over the situation and tells now, Saul, you will spend the night with me and I'm going to find out everything about your heart. Oh, if a man of God, a real man of God, appointed by God, said that to us, brothers and sisters, would we be um, welcoming to it? Would we bring that person in our home so that he could know everything that was in our hearts? Oh, Saul didn't want that. I'll talk to you, Samuel, but oh, I don't want you looking in my heart. And we know that because if you turn over a page here, and we're going to look at this tomorrow, God willing, you see there that he was given a new heart. He was given a, a, a new heart, brothers and sisters. You can see that in verse 9 of chapter 10. See that? He gave him another heart. Obviously, that's not a, a surgical he didn't perform a surgical operation, but that's the point. There was something wrong in Saul's heart. So God has to give him a new heart, turn his heart, so that his prospects were good. But Saul didn't want that, brothers and sisters. Saul didn't want that at all. Well, 
Samuel can sense this, and so he tries to give him encouragement. Verse 20, as for thine asses that were lost, yes, I know all about your asses, I will answer that. Um, yes, um, they're fine. Set not thy mind on them, for they are found. Right. So don't worry yourself about that sword, but there are more important things you need to be worrying about. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and all thy father's house? And so perhaps then there was already a consensus in the nation of Israel. Maybe there was a marketing campaign. Maybe that Saul was already the most popular choice. That the nation was moving towards rapidly now this king. And he was the ideal choice. This campaign of promoting this man. And Samuel says, look, you're loved by the nation. Everything is good for you, Saul. Everything should be fine. Now look at the response of Saul. Verse 21, and Saul answered and said, am I not a Benjamite? Of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, wherefore then speakest thou so to me? Well, we can look at that and we think, well, that's a very humble response. Well, it was partial. Yes, of course, he did come from the humblest of tribes, Benjamin. Remember that? The Judges 20 and 21, that very, very sorry story of when the Benjamites nearly got wiped out over that matter of the Levites' concubine. That's what he's referring to. They were already a despised tribe, graciously preserved. But he wasn't of the least of the families, was he? He was of the family of Kish, a great family. This was a lie, brothers and sisters. This was an excuse. He didn't want this man to look into his heart. He didn't want that experience, brothers and sisters. He knew that Samuel wouldn't find a good thing. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ looks upon our heart. And he knows what's in it, brothers and sisters. We can put on all the shows we like. Shirt and tie, marked our Bible. Bible schools, doing all the right thing. Oh, Jesus Christ knows what in that heart. So we don't fool him. And we'll be meeting him in a lifetime. At the very most. So let's get it right, brothers and sisters. Well, I would suggest the reason why Saul said this was twofold. First of all, I think it was an excuse. He didn't want Samuel to look into his heart. But also he's quoting someone. I'm sure you know this. If you don't, it's interesting. He's quoting another military campaign. And this was a man who loved Gideon. He loved Gideon. Let me just show you this. Come with me to Judges chapter 6, right? So, Judges chapter 6. We're going to pick up in verse 12. Now, um, in Judges 6, um, we have... In Judges chapter 6, we have um, uh, Gideon here, and he's going to... um, Uh, spare the nation of Israel from the onslaught of the Midianites. But look at this, how how, how, um, it reads here in verse 12. So he's a young man, he's appointed from Manasseh here, and the angel of the Lord, we read in verse 12, chapter 6, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Isn't that interesting? It's the same description of the family of Kish. Mighty Gabor, Man of valor, Sheil. It's the same description. And it's interesting, you know, because when you look in the concordance, it also belongs to Jeroboam. (laughs) Right? Isn't that interesting? It belongs to Gideon, Jephthah, Jeroboam, and Saul. Your choice is your Saul. What kind of man are you going to be? We all know about Jeroboam. He was appointed by God because of the foolishness of, of King Solomon. It could have been all Jeroboam's. But he was a fool. And he did terrible things in Israel, which we're going to see that Saul did as well. So the choice was his. But this was this mighty man of valor. Now look at this, brothers and sisters, because um, in this appointment, um, there's, a various, there's a various exchange that takes place between God and, and Gideon. It's interesting that, that the language is very similar to what Saul says to Samuel here. We'll, we'll pick up the account in verse 13. Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be the miracles which our father told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? I heard their cries, Samuel said, which took us back to Exodus 2 and verse 3. And I believe Saul had his mind on Gideon. We're going to see that all the way through the week. 
had his mind on Gideon. And this was Gideon's concern. Right? What we're seeing with the Midianites is just like Egypt. And didn't God spare us from Egypt? He's going to spare us from the Midianites. The Lord bring us from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and deliver us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor, and in Manasseh, and I am the least in the father's house. And we're going to see tomorrow, I believe, that the three miracles that were performed by Gideon for, for Gideon are three miracles. Uh, in a way, three signs that were performed for Saul. There's some lovely connections between Gideon and Saul. But that's the very, very same language, isn't it? So, so Gideon then is, 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 is trying to ascertain whether he is the right choice. Whether he is the right choice. But we know that he was a mighty man of valour. He was a man of strength. God made him strong for himself. God was never able to make Saul strong, was he? You know that. He had one great fight against the Ammonites in his first year, and then it was woeful. Never made Saul strong because he was never allowed to be made strong. What a contrast with Gideon here, brothers and sisters. So Saul, I'd suggest, wanted to be all like God, Gideon. He wanted to um, save the nation of Israel, but he didn't want to develop a heart like Gideon. That's the difference, brothers and sisters. That's the difference. Well, we know these words, don't we? As we um, make our way back to uh, 1 Samuel 9, we're just going to pick out a few points before we finish. But isn't it lovely that it's King David who says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me, try my reins and my heart. There was David who allowed God to fully search everything, every sin. Yet Saul had his hands over his heart, didn't he? He concealed it. He wouldn't let anyone near it. What kind of person are we, brothers and sisters? When we go to the altar of God, are we like a burnt offering where we allow God to cut between the pieces and examine us? What are we like, brothers and sisters, really, as private people, beyond the show of a Bible school? What are we really like, brothers and sisters? Well, I want to just, just finish here. It's in this lovely um, section here. When Samuel invites Saul within his home, and I know Saul's saying in his heart, I, I don't want you to, to look at my heart because I know it's not, not a particularly good one. But Samuel's not mocking him, brothers and sisters. And I'm sure in their early conversation, he knew exactly the kind of person Saul was. Just as God wasn't mocking them in heaven, neither was Samuel. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Um, we're just going to finish here. Verse 22, and Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlour and made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about 30, 30 persons. And Samuel said unto the, the, the cook, bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder and that which was upon it, and he gave it to Saul. So a few things I want you to notice at the close of our second talk, brothers and sisters. This is the, the respect that Samuel had for, for this king elect. He's going to listen to, to God. He's going to try his hardest with Saul. No wonder he was broken hearted later on. He places Saul in the chiefest place. That's his place. That's his seat. Uh, Samuel brings Saul into his home and says, I want you to sit here. Right? This was the man of God. This was a man who was a priest, prophet and judge. There was no greater man in all of Israel. Yet... This man respected Saul as superior to him because he was God's appointed king. And the other thing to notice, brothers and sisters, he gave him the shoulder in verse 24. And in this little scene here, brothers and sisters, I would suggest that what we're seeing is the head and shoulders. The head and shoulders. There was King Saul, or about to be King Saul, and he was head and shoulders over the nation of Israel. And, and Samuel now is acknowledging, yes, yes, of course, I can see you are head and shoulders, but I want you now to be the head and shoulders over the nation of Israel spiritually. And I'm going to work with you, Saul. You know the word chief? 
It's the word, and Brother Paul will like this, it's the word Rosh. And Brother Ken. It's the word Rosh. Head. Chief. It's the same word in Ezekiel 38. That's where he sat. And the shoulder, or what was that, brothers and sisters? Well, in Leviticus chapter 7, it is the heave offering, which spoke of strength, all one strength, dedicated to God. And that's exactly now what Samuel is going to do with Saul. He's going to give all his strength to this man to make him succeed, to be head and shoulders over the nation of Israel. Look at these words here in Leviticus uh, 7 and verse 32. And the right shoulder shall ye give unto the priest for heave offering of the sacrifices of your peace offering. This was something that was given to the priest. And he gives the very meal that was his to Saul. He gives his seat. He gives his meal to Saul. This was a man who was a special man. This was a man who was greater than Samuel. This was a man that could potentially be the fulfillment of his mother's prayer. That God would give, can you remember that in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 2? Can you remember that? God will give strength to the king. Isn't that lovely? Samuel is now acknowledging that this potentially could be the fulfillment of his own mother's prayer. The heave offering. And so the scene is set, brothers and sisters, as we conclude now. Everything was behind Saul. Even Samuel now acknowledges that Saul is greater than him, sitting in his seat, eating his food. Everyone now, even God in heaven, was working with this man so that he could be head and shoulders spiritually over the nation of Israel. And so with this opportunity and with this potential, brothers and sisters, what was he going to do with it? Well, God willing, we'll see tomorrow.